Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Blowing Up the Box, Disrupting the Customer Experience. I'm excited to have you here today. Before we uh, jump in, just a, couple, just a note on credits. So uh, CPE credits will be available for this webcast. So if you'd like to receive the credits, please stay online for the entirety of the webcast. And you can click the link in the request pod in the bottom right corner. Uh, of the webcast console to sign up for credit. Um, and please make sure to click the three pop-ups that appear on the screen throughout the program as well. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Blowing Up the Box. If you have showed up today to talk about disrupting the customer experience in your business, you are in the right place and let's get busy. I'm Gary Magenta. You've already met my colleague, Christina Choi. She's going to be the co-host today. And first, if you just want to find your way to the chat box in the corner of your screen, you can all comment on my necklace that I chose to wear today and let me know if you think it's too big or if it's just right. These are, in fact, my headsets, and I look like Mickey Mouse with this bald head with those things on, so I'm keeping them around my neck. Welcome, everybody. I promise we're going to have an interactive and fun experience today, and I hope that you get a lot out of this. Again, I'm Gary Magenta. I am the customer experience guru and chief change architect at a company called Root Inc. And for the last 30 years, I have had the opportunity to work with some of the world's most influential businesses around building a differentiated customer experience. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years at Root. Along the way, I've met a lot of really interesting organizations and taken some notes along the way that have turned out to be a few books. The latest book that I want to talk to you about today is Blowing Up the Box, Disrupting the Customer Experience. So let's unpack that and dig into that together. And before we do, I want Christina to have a chance to talk a little bit about what she does and some interesting fun facts about her life. Christina, hi. Hi, thanks, Gary. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Choi. I'm a consultant at Root, uh, focused on sustainment of change for our clients. And before Root, I had a background in public relations and marketing communication, and then got my master's in management in London. And when I moved to London, that's when I actually started my YouTube channel and was just sharing life, you know, going abroad, living abroad as a student, as a grad student. Um, and nowadays, I post about my career and my work as a consultant. You can see some of my videos there on the screen. Um, you know, what is change management consulting? What does a day in my life look like? Um, you can see one of my videos that I've done really well is a week in my life as a consultant um, with just over a million views, which I was shocked, but I think it's, you know, just people really enjoy seeing that authentic side. Um, and a little later today, I'll talk a little bit more about um, how influencers and how influencer marketing has, um, you know, changed the customer experience and customer expectations. So very excited to share that with you today. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Christina. I think Christina is going to add some interesting commentary because these days that digital content and the influencers that are out there play a large role in, in the changing customer experience. But before we get into that, Christina, I am coming for you. I have 14 followers on TikTok. I have 16 people who have viewed my latest videos. I am coming after you. Your million, your million clicks and your 100,000 subscribers, I am this close. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's get into a few promises. I promise you at the end of our time together today that you're going to understand the secret formula that all successful customer experiences share. And there is indeed a secret formula of three things that you're going to walk away with today. But I also promise you that you'll discover what your business can do to disrupt your customer experience and thrive. So you'll get to see some of those big things and even the small things that your business can start to think about. You know, for many of us, we've been on at different periods of our careers, different times in our businesses, what I like to call business growth highway. It's smooth sailing. There's no potholes, no red lights, no sort of traffic jams, people with road rage. None of that exists. And our business is just growing. 
But then we start to hit some bumps, and the road cracks below us, and the buildings start to shake around us. There's traffic jams, those potholes. Well, what is that? What is that change? What causes that change? Well, we call it disruption. So let's start here to start to talk to each other and find out what are some of the disruptors that you see. So, Christina, take us to this first chat question. Yeah, sure. I just shared a question in the chat. Um, but, you know, there could be lots of different things that disrupt your business growth and are those cracks or potholes on business growth highways. So what disruptions have you seen um, in your experience? And that could be today. It could be at other times in your career. Look at that nail order. Capital letter COVID. Excl exclamation mark for COVID. Triple exclamation mark. COVID is a huge disruptor, and it's kind of universal right now. Yeah, John, e-commerce, consolidation, inability to see our customers. Uber. Uber is an awesome disruptor. I think we may even talk about them a little bit today. Back office activities. I want to know more about that. Um, Ira, pencils. So uh, could know more about that as well. Remote working. For sure, remote working has really changed things. It looks like it may be here to stay. Location-based mo uh, marketing consolidation. These are all, uh, there is no wrong answer here, right? It could be economy, um, political environment, uh, government regulations, globalization, changing marketplace trends. Here it is right here. Ben says it. Consumer preferences. Yeah. And, and Ben says specifically for experiences versus things, which is a big one. Yeah, lack of trust. All of these things are big disruptors. So we want to talk about that a little bit more because disrupting your customer's experience is actually the key to survival. A lot of these things that you listed today are out of our control. We're being disrupted. But those organizations that survive, that actually thrive decade after decade, generation after generation, in some cases century after century, actually become the disruptors. And they become the disruptors not only in product and service, but it actually in their customer's experience. You see, what I've learned in all of these years is that customer experience is absolutely your key differentiator. It's like your fingerprint because in the marketplace, your products, your services can and will be knocked off overnight. But what can never be replicated, what is absolutely unique to you, is the way you make people feel that customer experience. And that is a key differentiator. So when we talk about this word disruptor, I just want us to get a common definition today. Now, I know this word is controversial. The word disruptor is in itself, some people say, oh, it's overrated or it's overused. But more and more these days, I'm hearing people say COVID, po political environment, globalization are true disruptors to our business. So as we're titling this new book, we took a chance and we, go ahead, we went ahead and put disruptor into the title and throughout the book because we believe it is more relevant today than ever. And as we were looking for that definition of disruptor, we found a lot, but Many of them we didn't agree with. So let's just take this definition here. A disruptor, according to this definition, creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market, displacing established market-leading firms. Well, just give me a yes or no. How many of you work for an organization that is an existing company? This is a throwaway question. You can even say yes or no, do you think you're a market leading firm at this time? How many of us work for companies that have been around for a long time? That's a heck of a lot of yeses coming in at the same time. Sure. Now, do you want to be displaced? Because according to this definition, a disruptor comes in and displaces those of us in leading firms or existing firms. I don't want to be displaced. And I know that my clients don't either. So I disregarded this very common definition and went in search for another one, one that I'll ask you to think about here. How about a company? That means any company that changes the traditional way an industry operates, especially in new effective ways. This absolutely can apply to all of us. 
a company that changes the traditional ways in new and effective ways or methods. Can we subscribe to that? What I'd ask you to do is hold that definition close today. So let's start to look at a few case studies. The way I see it is that Sears is absolutely the great disruptor. The great disruptor. Let me know if you agree. Yes, no, whatever your comment is. What do you think? Do you see Sears as the great disruptor? No, not anymore. No, no, no. I'm wrong? Ah, I'm not so sure. Not so fast. Sears is indeed the great disruptor of 1896. So we've got a couple of people. Yes, Sears catalog originally. Not now, but then. For sure, we agree. Sears is the great disruptor of 1896. They absolutely blew up the retail box with that mail order. Absolutely changed everything. Back in 1896, Sears revolutionized consumerism in North America through the catalog. Yeah, a lot of you have caught on in, in chat right there with me. Let's just look at it. Go all the way back in your time machine. It's 1896. We're there. And Sears come out and says, let's put the largest assortment of stuff, products, available through a mail order catalog. And let's be the first to allow for returns. And, and let's give a rewards program. Like the more stuff you buy from us, the more rewards you'll get. And guess what? Hold on to it. We're going to deliver this stuff right to your front door. This is really cool stuff. Well, come back. Come back in time. Come back into the future. It's now 1996. And it's Amazon. And they said, hey, wait a minute. What if we take the largest assortment of products available and put them in a catalog online? And what if we allow for returns with no questions asked? And a little bit later on, they said, how about we develop a prime membership? The more stuff you buy, the more rewards you get from us and catch it. Wait, wait, wait for it. We're going to deliver this stuff to your house. Yeah. That's awesome, Amazon. They actually perfected Sears innovations. So my question always is, why isn't Sears the Amazon of today? It's very, very similar. Why isn't Sears the Amazon today? And, and thank you, Adam. That's always a question I ask. What's the wackiest thing you could buy from Sears and they deliver to your house? That's another house. They would send you a prefab house. And we're talking 1896 stuff, right? And so Ben says, success makes complacency. Sure as heck did. Absolutely. So let's dig into that, Ben. Why is it that Sears is on the edge of extinction? Well, we did the research on that for this book, Blowing Up the Box. But before we give away the secret, Christina. Yeah, so um, Ben uh, started talking about this, success makes complacency. What are some other reasons that Sears is now on the edge of extinction today? Just chat that to us, please. Why do you think Sears is on the edge of extinction today? Leadership. What are they saying? Terrible leadership and did not modernize with the times. Lack of innovation, lost touch with customers. Um, a lot of stuff about customers not moving with them, not staying in touch with them, or changing with them, and not continuing to innovate and evolve. Yeah, for sure. Even down to culture. All of these things are obviously right. And we found some very specifics. Too stodgy. Yeah. We found some very specific um, items here that we want to share with you. One was there was an absolute denial, a refusal to admit the need to change. And that was that complacency that Ben uh, said right up front. We are sort of fat and happy, and we don't have to change. The world should comply with what we want and what we want to sell and do. And there was also what we found was what they called insularity, leaders who are unwilling to hear bad news. So if the leaders were on the 50th floor, the saying at Sears was, Bad news doesn't make it past floor 49. Didn't have the years for it. We're good. We're going to ride this out. And then, of course, the third thing that we found was paralysis. And that is they didn't jump on any of the bandwagons when they saw 
internet, when we saw the reduction of bricks and mortar, when they saw the changing consumer trends, the, the evolving generations of consumers, the buying trends, what did they do? They went out and they partnered up with Kmart, which was more of the dying same breed. So denial, insularity, and absolute paralysis were the three things that we saw that brought Sears to extinction. And I just have to say, what a sight it is to see the rise of Amazon right in front of us in all of our lifetime when their model is so similar to Sears and we see Sears literally just barely hanging on by a thread. It's just a shame. Yeah, and Gary, what this example shows is that the pace of change has never been this fast. And what we can learn from Sears is that you really do need to keep up with the marketplace. So we're going to fast forward. Yeah, you can change the slide. Thanks, Gary. We're going to fast forward another 10 years um, from 1996 when Amazon entered the picture to 2006. We have YouTube. Now, they were launched in 2005, technically. But then in 2006, they were acquired by Google, who then monetized the platform and launched ads that companies and brands could put on the videos. And what that ended up doing was that it allowed the content creators on YouTube to earn revenue on their videos because they would then develop a direct connection with their audience. And that opened the door for them to partner with brands directly and feature products, products that are relevant to their own channel and their own audience. So while YouTube doesn't really have anything to do with the retail space, they introduced this new way for brands to reach their consumers through these influencers and content creators, which in turn forced retailers to expand beyond that catalog, that catalog model of Sears and Amazon. And what consumers expect today is just so much more than you know a great deal and a large catalog. They want recommendations from people they trust. And their behavior has changed accordingly. So again, the pace of change has never been this fast, so you really have to keep up. So an example. Um, of Amazon and how they've responded to this change in consumer behavior and this you know, entrance of influencer marketing is they launched an influencer program where influencers can curate Amazon's massive catalog into a personal page so people can shop from their favorite influencer favorites directly. And so what this shows is Amazon, you know, instead of being disrupted, they took advantage of this new world of influencer marketing, and instead, they're channeling it into a way to continue offering products to their customers at a great price with a great selection, but they're just taking advantage of this new disruption in their space. Yeah, what I love about this for the retailer is this sort of one-click approach, uh, Christina. We're fast approaching the time where you can see your first favorite celebrity in awesome glasses on social media, click on those glasses, it's automatically ordered from your favorite purveyor and sent to your house the next day using your credit card in that one click. And that world is here, uh, or very fast approaching. And when we think about this in a B2C environment, that's awful cool, awfully cool. You know, we love Amazon because it makes it feel like Christmas every day. But what's really uh, interesting is that's also influencing the way B2B has to start to act and interact with one another. If I can do this at home, if I can get this feature in my personal life, I'm certainly going to expect it in my future life. And so Christina started by, by sharing the pace of change has never been this fast. And I'm here to tell you it will never be this slow again. By the time this call is over, the world will have changed once again. And so let's just look at that over time because the speed of change keeps getting faster and faster. Remember that. The speed of change gets faster and faster. Somewhere around 8,000 BC, the wheel makes its debut. Cool, right? Yeah, everybody could use a good wheel. But the wheel was actually introduced as a pottery wheel. And it was that way for many, many years. In fact, the length of time that passed between the pottery wheel and the wheel and its use in transportation was thousands of years. And then if you look at the leap from that wheel and those early chariots to the car was actually much faster. And from the car, to the airplane took even less time, and from the airplane to the wheels that rolled out the first rocket ship was even a shorter time. 
So it went from non-transportation to transportation to wheel out a piece of transportation that had no wheel at all. But if you just look at that timeline, oh my goodness, it gets faster and faster and faster. And so we have to think about what are the three keys that we can do to disrupt before our world is disrupted if we want to keep up with this ever-increasing speed of change. So I promised you these three secrets, and here they are. We will dig into each one of them in detail. You will be able to get the slides, so let me just share the first one. You must be, as an organization and as an individual in that organization, purpose-obsessed. We find that one of the most important ingredients is that your culture is one of entrepreneurialism, or that you have established, adopted, and actually brought to life an entrepreneurial culture. And finally, that out of this you create a unique customer experience, one that sets you apart from your competition, and that it's not just about the product and service, but it's also about the experience itself. So, let's dig into these. Purpose. You must ask yourself every single day, what is our purpose? Why do we exist? Why are we here? Why do we get up every day? And what are we willing to give up? Throw away to remain true to it. In other words, what are some of the things that we're comfortable with that we could say no to today in order to continue to deliver our purpose? And so, thank you. As we reflect on that, um, I've just posted another question in the chat. What is your purpose statement? Um, do you have one? Do you know it? Um, and if not, what do you think your purpose is? It's okay to say I don't know or I don't remember or I'm not sure if we have one. we got lots of people ready to... We don't have one. We do have one. To enrich people's lives and make the world a better place. Nobody doesn't love that. Mm -hmm. Eliminate cash. Don't have one. We keep, keep your food fresh. We provide power and water. I want to go to work for Christie's company to enrich people's lives and make the world a better place. Sure. So some of you have them, some of you don't have them. Some of them feel a little bit more like what you deliver versus purpose, but that's a little judgmental. So one person here says our purpose is to stay cash positive. I would just say our front lines in our business don't see that as a purpose. They see that as a goal. And so there's some of these here that I will just push back. Um, based on my experience and say some of what you're calling a purpose statement seems like goals or activities. And for those of you who don't have one, you'll see a little bit more about what one is and isn't. And for those of you who do have one, um, you can just sort of use our conversation to filter how um, effective you think yours is. But it's critical to this process. Let's dig into the next. Does your company culture allow for every person from leaders to the front line and everybody in between share their ideas because that's how I'm defining an entrepreneurial culture. Does everyone from corporate lead in the, in the executive suite to the front line have a voice? Oh, we've got a lot of yeses. A lot of yeses. Yeah, that's fantastic. Keep, keep talking to us. Sadly, no. Unfortunately, no. Ish, says Carl, but he said partially. Ish, um, yes. So all over the board, yes, kind of. These are all the typical answers. Some of you feel really strongly yes, some of you absolutely not, and some of you are in the ish category. That's true. And I bet you if you ask others in your organization, you may see sort of a spectrum there. Well, this is absolutely key. For those of you who have a congratulations, the question is, do you have all three? It's great to have one of these. Do you have all three? So the third one is about that unique customer experience. Are you creating an experience that your customer wants and needs from you, or are you creating an experience that you want and need from your customer? The idea of being customer-centric, user-centric back is really, really important. Are you designing for the customer's needs 
and back. If you're saying, this is what's important to us, let's go push it on the customer, you are one of those companies who I guarantee you will be disrupted. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but the next day will be disrupted or are ripe for disruption. So keep chatting us. We're looking. We're watching. You're working on your customer experience now. You're not doing things in an organized way. Yes. Do I hear a preach from anybody? Are you with me? Okay, so we're going to dig in with a little bit of some case studies here now. Let's start with Kodak, and we're going to use Kodak as our filter to check all three of those. And I use Kodak because it's so common. Everybody in almost every generation recognizes this brand. So Kodak had this, what I think is sort of a, a Christie-type purpose. Share moments, share life. I mean, from me, from where I stand, two thumbs up, that's awesome. I want to do that every day. I want to share moments, share life. And in different variations, they said share life's moments. So kind of maybe a check mark on the purpose of Seth. We've got to figure out if they walked the talk or not. So let's find out. Anybody know what this is? What this is a drawing or a schematic of? Well, I've got a spoiler alert for you. It is the design for the world's first digital camera. U.S. patent number is right here. It's 1978. We've got the world's first digital camera. And of course, it was created by this very young man at the time, Steve Sasson. Who did Steve work for, everybody? Anybody know? You're darn right, Adam and John and Mary Beth. Absolutely. You guessed it. He worked for Kodak. Good for you. Here's Steve's boss. Not really. It's just sort of like a, a Getty's uh, uh, <laughs> picture that we bought. But let's just say it's Steve's boss. Hey, Steve, we sell film, dude. Go back to work. What are you doing here? Oh, but by the way, I'm just going to see... CMA here, and I'll get this over to the patent office in case we can use it at some point. Yeah, Heather, it's a super sad story, right? So on that purpose of Seth, for sure, they had a great purpose. Did they bring it to life? No, because last time I looked, we could share life's moments right here. Matter of fact, I'll share a picture with you right now. Right? We can do that. We can share pictures with each other digitally. They just licensed the technology. They didn't actually really use it themselves. So great job at developing the purpose, bad job at actually executing it. Let's look at entrepreneurial culture now. So we give that a no because Steve's manager and the executive team didn't take this idea and bring it forward. Did it bring it to life? So it's a big no on customer, on entrepreneurial culture. We had the idea, we shoved it in a bottle, we put a cork in it, and we stuck it on the shelves until we were about extinct. And at the very end, it's a good thing that they patented it because they were selling that, that technology to keep themselves afloat. They were licensing it. So what's left? Let's look at this, this um, customer experience. Here's the way I see it. I'm going to go way back. I'm 57 years old next week. So I remember the cameras and taking them to the photo mat and with my mom. So customer wants to send a picture of their baby taking their first step to mom and dad who live across the country. That's not unusual. So take a traditional Kodak camera, take a picture. Then let's wait to use to get that picture because we have to get through all 36 exposures and that could take a day, a week, a month, a year until that film is completely used up. Then take the film over to the photo mat, leave them there and wait a week. Go back to pick up that picture, you're in the parking lot, you're looking through the pictures and all of a sudden you see little Johnny taking his first steps, you're so happy you're going to send it to mom and dad until you notice little Johnny has a red eye, I mean the dude is Satan. You can't send this picture to mom and dad. So you drive back through, you return to the photo mat, and the creepy guy that is there with serving customers, creepy guy, takes the picture. He's like, yeah, OK, I can remove this, but come back next week. So now we've got to go back another week, pick them up, 
then put it in an envelope and mail the picture of Johnny's first steps to mom and dad. And you know what? Johnny's first steps arrive just as he's graduating from high school. This is not a unique customer experience. This is not what grandma and grandpa wanted. What grandma and grandpa wanted was this. They didn't know it yet, but they wanted this. You got one new photo. You sent it from your phone to us, and we have it instantaneously. So when Kodak was thinking about digital, they weren't thinking big enough. And my question to you, and it's, it's kind of rhetorical, my question to you today is if, if we think about why isn't Sears Amazon, why isn't Kodak the iPhone? Why isn't Kodak Apple? I mean, if the phone became the camera, why couldn't the camera have become the phone? It's not beyond the, the, the realm of, of what's reasonable or rational to ask. So, did they deliver a unique customer experience? Hell to the no, Christina. What do you say? I agree. And um, this is, I just posted another question in the chat. So Gary quickly walked us through those three ingredients, purpose of best, entrepreneurial culture, and unique customer experience. Uh, so as you reflect, where are you the strongest? Where are you the weakest or most challenged? And you can use abbreviations um, if you don't want to type out. Um, Two or three. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, you know, one and three if that's where you're strongest and then weakest. So, so yes, I think Daniel. Who's the weakest? How would you rank yourself? So Adam says purpose obsessed as the strongest and unique customer experience as the weakest and another strongest for purpose obsessed from Barbara. Barbara and Adam, uh, maybe we need a support group. <laughs> Entrepreneurial culture is str strongest here. Strongest is unique customer experience, good for you. Ha uh, one and two are strong, three is the weakest. Most challenged on the customer experience, strongest on purpose. I, I, that's sort of thematic here right now. A lot of you have these great purposes, but we're not getting to that unique customer experience. From the, we got a strong culture, but we need a purpose. Culture is strong, not sure if it's entrepreneurial. So um, again, we're seeing your, well, many of you are from different client organizations, so you'll have different answers. I'm curious if you ask this question internally, if you'd even get answers internally. I was on with a world, um, uh, a pretty dominant uh, uh, global automotive company yesterday doing this this conversation with them exclusively, and they disagreed with each other even on where they were. So key takeaway here is you have to have all three and you have to execute all three. It's not enough to be purpose obsessed but not deliver a unique customer experience. It's not enough to have an entrepreneurial culture but not focused on our purpose, etc. So. But I, I love Christie's, uh, we have a customer experience that's unique, but it's not cutting edge. Man, we got to always keep sharpening that knife, so let's talk about how to do that. In the end, Kodak was too focused on selling film and not on what their customers wanted and needed. You remember I asked you the question, are you focused on what you want your customer to buy or what your customer wants to buy from you? In Kodak's case, they were too focused on selling film and not on their purpose and what the customer wanted. But what's really interesting is those photo mats from the 60s that I remember driving through uh, with my mom, they're still around, but they evolved. They've adjusted. They're still in business because they're selling coffee. That little piece of real estate has survived, and guess what? The creepy guy still has a good job because he figured out how to go from film to making coffee. We've got to be that agile. We've got to advance in ways we never thought we would advance or change before. And, and you know, going from a photo mat to a coffee shop is a pretty big change, right? But let's talk about little changes that make a really big difference, little changes that make a big difference. Something silly that always sort of top of mind for me, this poor guy's back in 1975 and he's bringing that luggage around. and. <clears throat> What's interesting is that we talked about the wheel before. The wheel came around in 8000 BC. Luggage came into our lexicon in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Why wasn't it until 1978 that somebody took the damn wheel and put it on the luggage? Why? I mean, it's, it's, they've both been around forever. It's just this little move, right? 
it's that little thing that made the big difference. And you're like, what's the big difference? This guy doesn't have a backache? No. He put an entire line of employees out of business. He made travel for the airport um, uh, independent. We got rid of Skyhops. We got rid of Bellman. It's incredible. So it created ease and also disrupted an entire group of people and the way they make a living. So let's look at another little thing that makes a big difference. We got a lot of coffee themes out there. There's a couple of baristas at a place called Starbucks out in California and they say, huh, it's getting hot. People want coffee. They're coming in every day, but they're saying, you know what? It's a little hot to have a hot cup of coffee. Have anything iced. So these baristas say, well, we have the coffee for sure. We've got milk. We always have ice here. We even give away water. What would happen if we just put the stuff that we have in a blender? What would happen if we took all the ingredients we have and we just shook it up? Well, what happened was it eventually evolved from these two baristas over time to something called the Frappuccino. And the Frappuccino evolved into a $3.5 billion annual business. I mean, this is no joke. We're talking, oh, wow, we got a little messed up in our slides here, and I don't know how that happened, but they advanced considerably. So we're going to get back. A $3.5 billion product and annual revenue that started with two baristas, a manager, a regional manager, corporate office with ears, and the ability to take it all the way down, back to the front line. So, I'm giving you an example of Kodak that really just disappeared, Sears disappeared, but Starbucks, a big established firm, still willing to shake it up. And I'm going to give you another one, an even older established firm. Even littler things can make a big difference. I'm going to talk about our friends at McDonald's. They had a major disruption, major industry and customer disruption that required no new inventory, equipment, training, recipes, nothing. What, what it did require were two words. Does anybody know what those two words are that caused this major disruption? Hmm. Typing. You're typing. Typing. <laughs> Surprise me. Drive through. Drive through. Oh my goodness. It's interesting about drive through, Adam, Desiree, Patrick. Um, uh, it's not breakfast. It's not happy meal. I'll tell you. you. A lot of you said drive through. Interestingly enough, another client of mine, Jack in the Box, invented the drive through in 1950 ish. So they were way before McDonald's on the drive through. Thank you, Carl. Breakfast menu. Any time. The words were any time. You see, back in, in the 1970s, they invented breakfast for QSR, quick service restaurants, and blew up the industry. But breakfast wasn't the two words. That did require new inventory, new equipment, new training, and new recipes. That required them to revamp their entire kitchen. They rode that wave for 40-some years. When they said all day to their breakfast, they literally sent the competition on their heels, consumers running in the door, and their stock market price went to the highest level ever with two words, all day. Call it more, all day breakfast. That's it. Desiree, you remember when breakfast was introduced or all day was introduced? Because I remember when breakfast was introduced. I grew up in New Jersey, and it was introduced in New Jersey, and I was at that restaurant. So. Breakfast from blowing up the box in the 1970s to all day, and it's just two words. So I don't want to make light of it. Obviously, they needed an advertising campaign, period. And it just took them to new heights. So let's move on. Somebody mentioned Uber before. How many here have ever had a grandmother that gave good advice? Heather, I remember my grandparents saying who would go out for breakfast. Ha, huh, you are right. All right, Christina, I'm sorry, I interrupted myself. You had a grandmother that would give you good advice? Yeah? I had a grandmother that would yeah. give good advice, too. I'm sure others, many of you are saying yes. So let's take a look at some of that advice. Christina, would your grandmother ever say to you, Christina, don't ever meet a guy on the Internet. It could be dangerous. Would she ever say that to you? Yes, probably. You didn't meet your <laughs> husband on the Internet, did you? 
Okay, good. No, old-fashioned right. <laughs> Christina, would your, would your grandmother ever say to you, Christina, please, whatever you do, don't get in a car with a stranger? Yes, I think she would say that, for sure. All of her grandmas. <laughs> or you will show up back at the house chopped up in little bits in a box. That's what my grandmother would say. Okay, what's this, everybody? What is this a picture of? And it's a real picture. What is this a real picture of? I'll look. It's like, no, my grandmother said finish Uber. homework. An Uber. <laughs> Uber. Grandmother. Uber. Grandmas. Christy, this is indeed a picture of three legit grandmas with a real Uber driver. The reason why we captured this is this fresh-faced young man is actually a rap singer trying to get famous, so he tapes his trips while he raps to his Uber customers. It's a real story. But those are legit three grandmothers who met a stranger on the internet and got in his car. Unbelievable. You see, your customers are willing to change. Your customers are willing to advance technologically in their mindset. And what is Uber changing for? Well, these are big changes and they made a big difference. Grandma doesn't want to wait out in the rain trying to flag down a taxi. Grandma doesn't want to be discriminated by her age or her race. Grandma doesn't want to be discriminated on because she has a cane or a wheelchair. And taxi drivers did that. Grandma wants to get from one point A to point B. And let me be clear, certainly not all taxi drivers. The majority of all of them are honest. But Grandma wanted to make sure she got from point A to point B in the most direct route for the least amount of money, not to go in a circuitous route and be charged more money. And Uber provided all of that. Tell us where you want and when you want us to pick you up, and we're actually incented to get there the quickest way. Just get in a car with a stranger. So how do you do that? How do you support that type of demand? I'll ask you, who is this a picture of, please? Who is this a picture of? Any idea? Not the person's name, but who does she represent? Yes, Uber driver. Mauricio, um, an Uber driver. But who is the Uber driver herself? Uber driver as a second job, Heather, for sure. And it's actually grandma. There you go, Desiree. It is, in fact, grandma as the Uber driver. So grandma is now the stranger being met on the internet and driving the car away. And I have got a hundred stories of grandmas that have driven me in Uber. I don't have a car. I live in a major city, and I am an Uber um, passenger, and I've got all kinds of Uber stories. I'm going to give you one very quickly. I met a grandma Uber driver who worked five days a week. Each one of those days, she took her takings for the day and sent them to one of her five grandchildren who are at five different universities, and she sent them spending money. You want to talk about purpose? That's awesome. And Uber had the ability to take the disenfranchised workforce and give them purpose and a place and a living. They were able to disrupt the customer experience and disrupt the employee experience, and that is a home run. What you find is they are indeed purpose obsessed about bringing transportation for everyone everywhere, creating an entrepreneurial culture by allowing drivers to work when they want, where they want, for as long as they want, and ultimately, be the perfect blend of technology, human interaction, and personalization, which almost all of us are going for in our businesses today. So to me, Uber blew up the box really, really well. And you see, disrupting your customer's experience, it's really difficult stuff. It's not for the lighthearted. But if you do it and you do it well, it's an awesome experience. It just feels icky. I mean, the chrysalis that that caterpillar has to go through is disgusting. It's this little ball of mucus. Well, that's what changing is all about. That's what disruption is all about. It's going to feel icky. It's going to feel really strange and strained. But on the other side of it, boy, it's really going to help us fly. And so. The call to action for you all today is that you can't just manage change. You must take charge of it. You must be intentional about the three secrets to change. Because there is a word of caution here, and, and as you can tell, I'm quite animated, and I like to be sarcastic, but this is a serious note. The business as usual graveyard is littered with companies that say, this doesn't apply to me, this too shall pass. 
This is just a trend. It's not me. It's not us. Or filled with executives who say, I only need five more years to my retirement, then let's worry, let the next generation worry. You don't have five years in today's marketplace. It's not going to pass. This is not just a fad. I'm going to say this here. Stuff's getting real. And it's super real, especially right now, if you look at the times we're in. So, let me give you one of my favorite examples of an organization that has done this for a long time and done it well. I can't give away the year yet, but we'll discover it together. What company has interactive entertainment at its core? Anybody? Disney. Awesome answer. TiVo. Disney. What else do you see? Google, Netflix, computer games. Be more specific with us, Carl. Amazon, Netflix, Netflix. Sure, feels that way. Carl, I'm going to do prices right rules your closest without going over. Interactive entertainment is, in fact, the purpose statement these days of Nintendo. Really? Huh. So let's go here. What decade was Nintendo established? Was it the 30s, the 50s, 70s, 20s, 60s, 80s? Oh, 80s, 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 70s, 80s, 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 
and the experience in which they get? Or are you going to blow it up and disrupt your customer's experience? Because you have a choice. It is completely up to you. So we want to leave some time for Q&A by chat, but I really want you to think about this piece specifically because when pre-COVID, as I was doing the research for this book and trying it out in speech form, I'd finish some version of this speech and get off the stage and there'd be a line of people that would say, but Gary, I'm only in this spot or I'm only at this title. I can't disrupt. Yeah, you can. Breakfast all day came from a franchisee. The Starbucks story about the franchisee came from baristas. And these stories, go, the digital camera came from a guy who was an intern turned first job. Yeah, your front line has their hands on the pulse of the customer. And you may too. So I want to give you a new title as you think about this. As you think about, can you really influence? Yes, you can from where you sit. I want to dub you, I want to dub the CDO. You're the CDO. You're the Chief Disruption Officer. No matter what your title is today, you can start a, a disruption movement as the Chief Disruption Officer. So with that, we want to leave a few minutes at the end for Q&A, and we also have to uh, give you some closing information about what's coming up next. So let's start with this. This is the information to be in touch with me or Christina. We'll leave it up for a few minutes. Feel free to tweet, face, uh, to connect on Facebook, email, go to a website, and of course you'll see Christina out there in digital fame. You should subscribe right away and follow this influencer. She's amazing. But right now what we like to ask you is what questions do you have or what additional thoughts or comments that you have that you may have for us? Go ahead and type them in and don't be shy. This was the most interactive webinar I've been to lately. Great, great technique. Thank you, Carl. We appreciate that. Give two thumbs up. Um, how to apply this to a service industry? Um, yeah, thank you for agreeing with that. Um, thoughts on service, because that, I think um, you really get that in that area as well, Christina. You have some thoughts on that? To a service industry versus products that, you know, McDonald's and Starbucks are offering. Um, I mean, I think that it really is a formula that can apply, whether it's a product or a service. I think if I think about the clients that I'm working with, um, you know, Anybody on our team can get a pulse of what clients want and what experience um, and unique experience they want to have. Um, we, of course, have a purpose at Root. It's to invigorate the power of human beings to make a difference. Um, and we use that, you know, every day as we do our work. Uh, so, you know, other than just really just thinking about what is it that differentiates you, like having that purpose statement and going through those three um, steps of the formula, I think um, it always resonates with me and is something that I think about um, regularly as I think about my interactions with our clients. Christina, what you're describing to me, if I can put it into the word, um, uh, is empowerment. When you're in a service industry, you're oftentimes um, have people who are interacting, who are delivering that service. So for us in, in consulting services, um, we're always looking at how do we empower our people, and I know this for other organizations, with a few things. In the service industry, you have to empower your people to ask great questions, to understand the needs of the client so they can adjust in the moment, and that empowerment allows you, allows your people to deliver what the customer needs and wants as long as it aligns with our purpose without having to go back and make a thousand um, check-ins on that. Uh, what tips do you have to anticipate customers' wants and needs before others? Go to your front line, Christy. Services or product, go to your front line and ask them. Sit in those conversations because if they don't, even if they don't know it, their customer is expressing new needs and wants in every phone call, email, and interaction they have. When you hear it once, it's interesting. When you hear it twice, your Scooby ear perks up. When you hear it three times, it may be a trend. 
Um, mindset, uh, sorry, how do you make one as a dis how do you make one as disruptor as this word itself isn't positive sounding via training and guidance? Oh, how do you make one a disruptor, a person a disruptor? I don't know. You know, I'm I still struggle with this word even though it's the, in the title of, a, of one of my books. Um, I think disruptor can be very empowering. You have the ability to disrupt this, but disruption for good. If things are stuck and broken and not work, shake it up. So innovator is the word that I use when disruptor doesn't work. Allow your people to be innovators. Allow them to shake it up. So how do you do it? Empower somebody or dub them as an innovator. I've hijacked the chat a little bit with my marriage announcement, Gary. <laughs> oh, were you going to announce that right yeah, here? Some, someone had noted that my name is different on LinkedIn, so I was just sharing uh, why that was so. So. <laughs> okay, so let's do it right here. When did you get married, Christina? I actually got married um, August 1st. Our wedding was supposed to be October 3rd, but we you know, were disrupted by COVID, and so we canceled and did an intimate, you know, immediate family ceremony instead. <laughs> yeah. So congratulations, and you did it in your parents' backyard, and you said it was lovely, and you're one of two root family members who got married in their parents' backyard this summer. Good for you. <laughs> Christina, before we go, I want to see if we can get to Ben. Mm -hmm. Secret to break the things that make us successful. I'm not sure I understand that. Um, so, Ben, if you can offer more clarity, I'll get to Michael's comment. Actually, disruption is the current word and process for Joseph um, uh, Schumpeter's creative dis uh, destruction thesis. Thank you. Um, I would say disrupt gets people's attention and make it whatever you need it to be. Um, from here, I want to thank you so much for your time and attention because I know our friends at the conference board have some more information they want to make sure they get to you. So with that, I'm going to give you a huge thank you so much. We really enjoyed you being here. Your participation was awesome, and I want to hand it over to our partners at the conference board to talk about the upcoming West, uh, webcast programming. Um, send us your thoughts, letters, comments. Thank you, Patrice. We enjoyed having you as well. Conference board? Thank you so much, Gary. That was fantastic. If you all enjoyed today's program, we have more upcoming webcasts that may be of interest to you. Click the links in the downloadable presentation to register for the following programs or visit conference-board.org to see a full list of upcoming programming. In addition, our Human Capital Insights podcast series is a great resource for talent executives wishing to address challenges and stay informed about current issues across the entire spectrum of human capital. You can register for those at conference-board.org slash podcast. And finally, if you're interested in collaborating with the Conference Board to produce another great program like what you saw here today, please reach out to us. You can discuss webcast sponsorship opportunities by contacting sponsorship at conference-board.org. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Christina and Gary. Everyone. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Conference Board.